Hello, in this video, I will present the semantics for asynchronous function calls and futures for mini while. Uh, before that, we've seen how to have shared memory in mini while, so we can a bit forget about that. We'll place ourselves in a setting where we don't care much about shared memory and we'll rather focus on a parallelism due to futures and creation of tasks. Before that, uh, I think it's worth recalling the semantics of mini while with functions. Uh, some of you might not have followed the end of this, the previous video that was presenting it, so I need anyway to get a bit into details. And it's a good opportunity for you to remember or catch up. This is a reminder of what we've seen in the course for functions in the part dedicated to small step semantics. One way to have a small step operational semantics for a function is to create a new kind of configurations. In those configurations, as usual for small step operational semantics, you either have a statement or not if you are in a final state. But the difference in the rest, and in the rest you have something that represents the memory state that is made of two parts to deal with global versus local variables and having of variables. Um, and this sigma, the, the idea is that in sigma you have bindings all of the form variables to locate memory location. And this is in sigma. And in the store, store you map memory location to values. So by accessing sigma then store, you would go from a variable to a value. So that's the idea of decoupling that. And the idea how, why we do that is that sigma will change depending on the context and in, on the function in which we are, while well, store represents the memory and it won't change. I mean, it will be affected by assignment, but not by changing of context. Uh, and that you already seen that you have already seen that even for the big step semantics, for the small step semantic, we need something that we call CTX, and that is the call stack. So it's a context of call of successive call that lead it to the current function, and uh, we will find elements in this context, and those elements will be mostly made of different sigma that can appear. So let's have a look at the semantics with that and uh, see how it's used. If you want to do an assignment, you want to change the memory. So indeed, you would return everything unchanged except that store has a new value at which place? At the place of x, but x is not a location, so the place of sigma of x. And at this location, you will have the evaluation of the expression e uh, inside the right uh, environment, and the right environment is made of the current position between store and sigma. So you would map variable to values directly for having the valuation of expressions. So that's how you deal with memory. The other part is how you deal with sequence. And as usual for sequence, it's a bit it's just reporting what we have usually for the small step semantics. If you have the evaluation, if you want to evaluate your sequence S1, S2, and you have S1 that reduces in one step to nothing, then you just have S2 that remains to be evaluated. And if S1 is evaluated to some remaining statement S1 prime, then you just put S1 prime instead of S2. And you have all the things, you consider that all the things can, can change, basically. And you report the changing. Uh, you have similar rules for if, skip, and while. There's no much interest in showing them here. I mean, the big principles are in the sequence and in the assignment. Okay, so this does everything except the functions. So the other slide of the uh, old semantics we had is how do we deal with the functions? And it's all presented here. Uh, so we have basically two rules, one for call and one for return. Uh, what the call does is that it finds first, depending on the function, the parameters and the current memory, uh, it finds a new 
execution environment to be used for evaluating the function, which is s prime sigma prime stop prime. So when you encounter a function call, I should have started by that, uh, you calculate this s prime sigma prime stop prime, and you will use them as the new current uh, configuration for being evaluated. And you mustn't forget where you came from. You, you must remember what were your sigma before and what was your statement before, because when you will finish the execution of this function f and thus of this statement s prime, you want to be able to recover the statement s, for example. So you save all those informations inside the context here, which is the call stack. And you see, you just save sigma as it is, you save s as it is, and you just save a placeholder holder here that says uh, is assigned to the return of the function f. That's how we call it that. So if you summarize, ctx is a list of stigma statement. It's necessary that the big thing here is the whole current statement. There mustn't be something left remaining, but uh, this is imposed by the whole set. Uh, and r of f is a marker, as I said, that remembers the name of the function call and will be useful for the return. This is the definition of bind three. It's the, mix, the external function we use to compute the new execution configuration for the function. What it basically does is that it creates a sigma prime with fresh locations. So you have you will find um, fresh locations wherever you need, fresh locations for parameters and fresh locations for local variables, and you will just initialize the value of the location that corresponds to the parameter to the values passed as parameter to the function. And you just extend the previous sigma by this. Okay, and last rule that we have seen is how to deal with the return. If you have finished with the function, it means that this s prime will have disappeared and you're just left with the context, a sigma prime and a storm. And then what you will do is that you will recover this configure this as a current configuration to be evaluated. So you recover S, you recover sigma, and it's almost everything done except that you must still assign the result, the return value to the uh, to the variable x. And that's what we do this way. We pick the weight of f. I don't know if you remember if you have a uh, if you have return of e at the end of the function, right of f is the expression e. So it's the expression inside the return. And so you evaluate the expression inside the return, inside the right memory, and you, you use that for, uh, for finding the value v here, that is the return value that you put inside x. Of course, you need to do reference by, by sigma dx. Okay, so that was the recalling the previous semantics we had. And I hope enough explanation to be able to follow the rest. If you believe it might not be enough, you can just pause the video and try and catch up with the video that was done for function semantics a few sessions ago. Now we're ready to extend the existing syntax with futures. So the idea of this extension is mostly to add asynchronous function calls that is written using this syntax. So it looks like a function call, but we just add the async keyword in front of it. And this will have the effect to create uh, a task that will be responsible for fulfilling a future. Uh, so this creates a future and now we must be able to access what's inside the future. And so in this language, we have the primitive get of E, which takes as parameter a future and synchronizes on the future resolution in the sense that it waits until the asynchronous function call corresponding to the expression E the asynchronous function call terminates and fulfills the future, and then this will return the value that is stored inside the future. If you want a small drawing illustrating that on a small tiny example, uh, the idea is that, so this is the main, and at the beginning of the main, uh, you declare variables, which are two integers, and one future to an integer. So we don't see the typing yet, but uh, this is a typing for a future that will contain an integer. 
And the first thing it does is that it calls a uh, function f uh, asynchronously with parameter 3. So this will have the effect to trigger the execution of f of 3 here. And, uh, and this creates a future uh, that we, would, we could call it big F because we use small f for function names. So this creates a future big F and it stores it inside the vi variable t. Then what you could do is that you could run synchronously the same function f but with a parameter 4. So this will trigger the same code but in parallel with the other. You have parallelism here between those two threads. And at some point, the thread of left or the thread of right first, but let's suppose it's a thread of on the left that which the get statement and it will try to get the value that is inside t, which is indeed a future to an integer. Here it will be f. So you try to do a get of f and if this is first, it means that the execution of f of 3 didn't terminate, it's perhaps in the middle. Uh, and while it didn't terminate, this blocks here, which are just waiting on the get statement on the left side. And on the right side, you would do the execution at some point because you need to progress. And when you reach the end of the execution, you will reach the return statement that will give you return of z, which will give you six. Uh, and this six will fulfill the future f. So now we will have f is 6 and you will do get of f which will return the value inside which is 6. So you see that this allows at the same time parallelism and uh, handling function returns in a nice manner. Let's now try to write the semantics for that. Uh, we'll do a design choice here is that we will choose that we will have no global state in our semantics. The first choice is to have a global state and this allows us uh, to have race condition between tasks which is not only a good thing because of course it's very versatile and it allows communication of data between tasks but it makes the result much more non-deterministic and it's not necessarily a very safe way to program. Uh, we could perfectly specify this but we could also specify another variant that has no global state and in that case, you have results that are a bit more predictable because uh, you don't have overlapping between variables of the threads. And so you don't have races between the different threads trying to write on the same piece of memory. So the second is safer. The first is more expressive. And additionally, the second case corresponds to mini-C because we have no global variable in a mini-C language. What we will choose uh, is to adopt the second solution. First, because it corresponds to mini-C, but also because it's safer. Um, however, if you want to implement the first solution in the semantics, it's not much difficult. And we've already seen how to deal with simple shared memory parallelism previously in this course. So you could imagine it's not really more complicated. So now that we made choices and we explained a bit what we wanted to do, let's try to write the semantics for futures in of mini while. Uh, so as you have seen, we need identifier for futures that are created because those are neither variables nor, vi nor memory location nor values. I mean, I mean, they will be considered as values, but as particular values. So we, I will call them big F and big G just choose identify which I just need to choose identifier that are not taken by the way to start the syntax. That's why I don't take small f because small f was used for functions. And now the values can also be featured identifiers. They can be features identifiers, integers, and booleans if you have booleans. So now the configurations are as before almost but you also have inside you can also have a configuration that is a future. Uh, that's a bit like on the semantic for futures we've seen before. So, but we only store in the configuration resolved future. That's the choice. Um, so this means the future have, has been resolved. So the task corresponding to it has finished and it returned value V. We also have in the configuration, the concatenations of pieces of configuration because you can have at the same time 
several futures or a future and some tasks ongoing. So this is exactly the configurations we had before, except that we have as an index here, well, a future identifier. This means this task is supposed to fulfill this future. And remember, this is the left case is the case where the task is not finished and the right case is the case where the task either is finished or there's still something in the context to be uh, unstacked. Um, configurations are identified modulo reordering of tasks. We don't care about ordering and we won't mention reordering of tasks in our semantics. We'll just suppose that a step of reordering can be done whenever we want. And yeah, that's what I mentioned before. We don't put unresolved future in the configuration, which was not the case for lambda calculus with futures. That's just, that's just a design choice that has not much influence on the semantics, in fact. So first thing we do is that we adapt sequential reduction rules uh, straightforwardly, just adding um, future identifier to the tasks on drawing and and putting them inside the configuration CN. This exists both for the case where the small step reduces to a statement to be evaluated or the statement is finished. So now let's try to see how we could write the semantics for asynchronous function calls. So let's take a first a bit naive uh, solution that would probably be the first intention you would like to write. So when you encounter an, an asynchronous function call, anyway, what you want to do is to use the bind three uh, function that we used before to find the right environment context to evaluate this function asynchronously. And you also want a fresh future to associate it with it. So if you have a task that corresponds to form, to future f, then you can spawn a new task that corresponds to future g. And fresh means it's not somewhere else in the configuration. Though this seems to do what we want to do, but don't forget that we will need to return from the function at some point and fulfill the future. And the problem here is that we have lost the return expression that was stored by r of f in our sequential semantics, and it's still in the synchronous call. So at the end of this task, we won't be able to know what to fill the future G with. So this semantics is not working. I mean, it's doing 90% of the job, but not 100%. So here is what we, I suggest to do. Uh, the solution I suggest is to add a return of E to the CTX, which is a cold stacks, remember the context of the current function. And, um, this called stack now finishes by a return E, possibly, not mandatory, but. So in fact, when I will spawn this new task, instead of putting nothing that I did in the first intention here, I will just put something that corresponds to the return. So I will write in return and what of S is the expression E that is inside the return statement. And in that case, uh, it would work because now when I reach the end of the evaluation of this task, I would reach something where this S prime is not here anymore. The CTX is, uh, I've run stacked if there were other synchronous calls and I just, I'm just left with one thing remaining, which is return of E. And in that case, I say, oh, now I know the value of the future F. It's the expression E that is inside the return statement. So I just need to evaluate it. And this will give me a value that will be the value that is associated now for the future. And the only thing I didn't do yet is the gate statement, which is trivial. If I need to evaluate an assignment to a gate statement, what I'll do is that I fetch the value V that is stored inside the future. A big F is missing here. This will be corrected in the final version of the slides. So one thing you could notice is if there's no future G resolved, that is if the G task is still ongoing, this rule doesn't apply. And so the gate statement is stuck. Now what I suggest is uh, that you use the semantics to evaluate the previous uh, informal example to give it a formal semantics. As usual in a small step semantics, I suggest you 
for the not too much important state to uh, forget a bit about the uh, predicates of the inference rules if they are not very important so that you can focus on the main execution, which might be a bit long. And you probably don't want to enroll the execution of the synchronous invocation because, because you already know it. So as usual, I suggest you to pause here, try to do it, and, and I will provide a manual correction with the video. So in this video, we are trying to unroll the semantics for the example uh, that is given in the course that does an asynchronous invocation and then a synchronous one. So it's uh, an example where the main body of the main function looks like this. So first question we ask ourselves as usual is what is the right initial configuration? So I've denoted here, uh, so this is the initial configuration. It's built from the main statement and an initial sigma and an empty memory. Um, the initial sigma is x uh, must map x, each of the variable to locations and we'll say that locations are variable uh, Value are integers, and I will underline them in blue to differentiate them from the normal integer. Um, so this is very similar. If you didn't find it by yourself, uh, in intuitively it's quite normal, but it, you could get inspired by what we had for the functions and, and try to find something that fits. So basically, most of this was already used in the cases of functions. We needed to add here a fresh future identifier that is used nowhere. And if you, for the small step semantic, remember we need a call stack here. Uh, that might be, some, be something you didn't see for the function, doing the function calls. And, um, and here it's empty because there's no call stack. It's, remember, it's a CTX that contains a call stack. So we start from this and we see what we can do. So we don't have much choice. As usual, I won't detail the uh, premises, but I will tell you which rules I apply. So I must apply on this part of the configuration. I don't have the choice. The sec rule, and it's which itself rely on the async rule. And the async rule is required to find to find a um, fresh future, so I'll call it G. I obtain the following configuration. With the new task spawned, and the new task is the body of the function S that you can check on the slide, which is, now that's the body. Uh, now remember that we put the return here to remember where you what you resolve the future with, and we should place ourselves in sigma one. Sigma one must, must be designed. It should find new memory locations because we don't mess up with the other memory. So we said that in sigma one. So it must be new, new locations, but it must be loca new locations inside this task, and this task has nothing. So in fact, you, we can take x to zero and z to one. If you find it clearer, you can find new fresh names, but it's not useful here. And the initial memory maps the location 0 to 4. This is to remember the value of the parameter, which is uh, to 3. To remember the value of the parameter, which is 3. So now, indeed, x maps to 0, that maps to 3. Let's go on the right to go for, to do one more step. So now we should choose which part of the which task we uh, will progress because both tasks could progress let's suppose i choose this one so in this task i can simply do a sequence with an assign and this is very classical so i will just show you the result it just puts the future g at the right place in memory of this task
and the rest is the same. So suppose that now we want to do the other task. So it should be here, but I suppose I will write it below because it can be done in parallel and it doesn't mess up with the rest and it saves a bit of space. So in fact, in theory here, we have the same thing and you have another state, state which stays the same up and have a new one below, but, but I'll do it below. So you can note that here we reached the end of the evaluation here, so we don't have statement to execute anymore, so we'll soon reach the return statement. Suppose now we just do the top state, so it will be in fact a function call. And this function call, what it does is that it will save this state somewhere. So I will have the statement of f somehow. And I will save sigma 0 and this big statement s prime. I won't detail everything here, I just want to give you the structure s prime. I get into a sigma 2, which is a sigma for f, and a memory that has 2 g plus the parameter. Okay, so let me just skip the body and I get back to the main statement. Now I have to evaluate x is get of t. This is back to empty, and I have still two maps to G. I'll forget about the variables inside F because they won't be useful, but I'm, I assign Y, which is at location 1, to F of 4, which is 4 plus 4, so it's 8. So at 1, I have 8. And at zero, I have nothing for the moment. And I probably have a three to something here, but I don't care. So this is this task F. The task T didn't move. So it's still this. Uh, you might have noticed that here I forgot sigma zero. Now I could do, for example, the foot resolve. And the value of z in this thing, so you can check that z is at location 1, so the value of z is 6. Now I know the value of g, and here I have the same for f. And now I can evaluate the get statement. You can notice that here, this task, this task here, the f task was stuck for the moment because it was trying to evaluate a gate and the future has not been resolved yet, but now it is. So one thing, other thing you might notice is that in fact to do this get, we needed to evaluate, in fact we checked val of t in, uh, in a certain memory Compose with sigma zero. So we fetch the value of t, which is at location two, and it gave us g. And then we could check that g is here. So that's how we got the six. And now we can do the last step, which is this this determination of the task f. The last thing we can do about it is the evaluation of the assignment. And we still have the future we want. And this is it. This is the final step. So we did this evaluation. Uh, it's a long chain here, but basically we did sequence and asynchronous invocation and get, which just parallelized two steps here.